望むならば右腕もそれでも足りなければ両の足も In the middle of the climax of Hunter x Hunter's Chimera Ant Arc, there is a moment of horrifying and conflicting quiet that occurs directly in the eye of the storm, during which Neferpito reflects with great happiness at the prospect of her imminent death. Demise at the hands of this new monstrous Gon would no doubt render him unable to use this power on her king, and so she is more than willing to sacrifice all that she is if it means carrying out her life's purpose. Comparing a snapshot of this royal guard in this state of embracing oblivion to her behavior at the onset of Meruem's birth without context may lead one to believe that there was no great change in Pito. Of course the gravity of the situation would dictate that her peculiarities would fall by the wayside in the former scenario, but by and large, she lived solely for her king in the beginning, and she offered that life for her king in the end. But it is through the wealth of subtle, tiny changes that occur within and around this character in the elapsed time that the interpretation of this final moment gets a wholly different and utterly profound meaning. The brief journey of Neferpito is unbelievably rich. On one hand, it is a beautiful arc studying an individual who grows to broaden her perspective and learn about the nuances of the world, who stumbles into empathizing with others and finds a selfless love greater than one can imagine. But simultaneously, it is a tragedy of someone bound by that very same love, a love rooted in a duty that never allowed her to be free enough to live for herself. Yet despite this, at the same time Pito undoubtedly found peace and purpose in the short life she had and the role she fulfilled, which amplifies both the joyful and sad sides of her character. She is the epitome of contradiction in this way, and today we're going to dive into exactly what makes her so poignant. Pito enters the story very much like a predatory cat, appropriately. She acts instinctually, following her impulses and the purposes and motives that seem to be built into her psyche. She is cruel, but it seems very much to me that she does all of the things she does not out of any true ill will or malice towards others, but as a result of a mixture of it being her duty and it being something she views as beneath her, as a fun game. But most of all, this is her built-in instinct, her programming. Upon birth, it was just the way she was made to think, that killing and serving the king is all that comprises her life, approached with a cat's nature. So of course she doesn't stop to think of ethics, nor does she really have any intent of evil. It's just who she's supposed to be as a royal guard, so she embodies what feels right in the beginning and that unfortunately results in direct antagonism for our characters, viewing the lives of most others as not being of much consequence and looking at Kite as an entertaining diversion to test her strength on. In her early life, Pito simply isn't capable of understanding the weight of her actions because she has no experience, knowledge, or context to draw from when it comes to what death even means. To Pito, killing and using others for her purposes and playing with her prey is as natural as a feline killing a mouse, and she never thinks about the moral ramifications of anything she does, until she is given reason to. Human beings, a species that Pito is undeniably a part of, are very often incapable of truly understanding things until they themselves experience them. You can feel sympathy for a friend who loses a loved one, but only once you yourself have lost a loved one can you really feel empathy and sincerely relate to and understand them, which allows you to connect through your pain. Life knowledge, and in this case, experience of suffering makes you all the more capable of kindness and perspective with regards to others. And so with no information or experience of personal emotional trauma, Pito is incapable of exercising empathy, compassion, kindness, and perspective. Uninterested in bargaining, completely lacking in light humanity, going off animal instinct and using human beings, and strong ones at that, as tools and commodities to be disposed of after use. And this makes this monster looming ahead of Gon, Kilua, and Kite so terrifying. Because every 
antagonist up until this point had been imbued with some semblance of a layered or interesting viewpoint so that we can more accurately understand them or find intrigue with them, which helps humanize them and make them feel more multidimensional. Either that, or they're a loser like Genthru, who despite being executed just fine, was someone we all knew was just never going to be a genuine threat when all was said and done. None of these antagonists' actions are shown to be justifiable, but the majority of them are very understandable or intriguing, and trying to better understand them can make their threat level seem like less of a factor, at least for me. Pito is entirely different though. She's just an animal bound to her brutal duty, and in the beginning she is devoid of anything but that aforementioned instinct. Quirky personality aside, she's a blank slate, sadistically playful and focused on her goals pertaining to the king. And if you add the context of this portion of the story and her enormous power to that, it makes her comfortably the most outwardly threatening thing that we've experienced up till now. It's enough to cause such immense feelings of powerlessness in both Gon and Kilua for different reasons, and the almost innocent way Pito goes about this only goes to reinforce how little there is to her mentality at this point. Pito's version of purity definitely hinges on the dark. Hmm. <laughs> However, what else is a blank slate if not a foundation for something to grow from? Because from the minute her king is born, something begins blossoming inside Pito, the beginnings of what I view as a platonic love. And its effects are not noticeable to her or anyone else at first, but a seed of care and compassion sprouts when she first meets the one she is to serve, just as the seeds of egoless contradictory honor and maddening delusional idealism were planted in Yubi and Poof respectively. Nothing within her changes right away except her capacity for change, but that is enough and that is what makes all the difference. Meruem is this individual who is quite literally Pito's entire purpose for existence in the same way he is for Yupi and Poof, but added to that is a huge and true amount of affection, which amplifies this connection to the nth degree. Of course she cares for him and has his best interests in mind, and so do the other two, but they diverge in the manner in which that care manifests. Poof begins to break down internally as the image of the king he is supposed to serve becomes incongruent with the real king, and does whatever he can to preserve Meduem's original purpose out of pure duty. Yupi empties himself and seeks only to be Meduem's shield, unthinking, immovable, and humble, an empty vessel from which a conflicting chivalrous code later rose into prominence, and Pito begins to wish for Meduem's best interests. She begins to want for Meduem what he wants for himself, and not what she had been programmed to want for him. And one of the first instances of this is her response to Meduem's musings about what his name should be a scene I've talked about quite a lot in the past for how masterfully it divulges the contrasting mindsets of the three royal guards. Somewhere down the line, Pito's unbending royal guard allegiance morphed into something resembling a real love for Meduem, a desire for him to be happy even if that happiness usurps his original purpose. Poof defaults to the title of king, and Yupi feels incapable and unworthy of answering such a question, but Pito's answer is the only one that consists of any true understanding of why Meduem was asking in the first place. Pito is the only royal guard to really see Meduem as a person. She is the only one to look at his evolution and not be averse to it, and she's the only one to not care about him fulfilling his cold destiny as long as he himself is happy. While I've gone to great lengths in the past to describe why Poof is an exceptional character who is paradoxically unsurpassed in his loyalty, 
Pito is far and away the only one who managed to understand who Meruem was without having to be literally connected to his mind. And that's because the human trait that took root in her was a mix of true care and empathy. She is willing to have Meruem's best interest at heart because she cares for him as an individual, and she's able to understand those interests because she has the perspective to see through his eyes and intuitively comprehend how he must feel. And this just grows over time as she unquestioningly obeys Meruem's orders about accommodating Komugi, and ultimately becomes the one he defaults to when it comes to carrying out his wishes, the only one with no qualms about caring for the girl. When it comes to priorities, his protection is of utmost importance, but for Pito, right up there with it is his desire. More than anything, what this all comes down to is the fact that Pito just wants to see him happy and healthy. She wants to do anything she can to contribute to that. And this idea is the precursor to what I view as one of the most powerful scenes in the entire series. A moment stopped in time. Five people in a room. One unconscious, four perfectly still for differing reasons. Then time begins to move again, and Midwim implores, pleads with Pito about his one desperate wish. Pito. Pito being so overwhelmed that she's moved to tears at this request has always been a curious and complex moment to me. There are several factors at play here. The sheer stakes of the moment, the unbelievable amount of darkness emanating from Meruem, the extent to which it was clear that he cared for such a frail human, perhaps a hint of the idea that Pito felt saddened by the fact that he seemed to show this girl more care than he ever spared for her. But more than anything, I think she weeps here out of sheer conflicting fulfillment because of Meruem completely, wholeheartedly depending on her for the happiness she so wishes for him. Everything rides on her. If she can heal Komugi, her master will be joyous. If she cannot, he will be despaired. This is essentially the apex of her life as this new empathetic royal guard, with her king relying so much on her and in such a heartfelt way. And so this moment is the peak of her existence in a way similar to how Poof and Yupi felt through reviving Meduem, though their reactions were obviously quite different. But it's very key here that while their moments of peak existence resulted from rescuing the king's life and physical body, Pito's came from a much more abstract situation, saving his emotional soul rather than his mortal one. I'm sure that she would have been fulfilled beyond belief to have sacrificed her body for the protection of her king as the other two did, and she actually was when encountering the conceptually similar situation I discussed later on. But I'm even more sure that neither Yupi nor Poof would have realized the sheer weight and profundity of Meruem's request here to the extent that Pito did, because they could never have wished to understand him the way Pito did. Healing Komugi had no bearing whatsoever on Meruem surviving and becoming the ideal Chimera Ant King. In fact, her dying would have made that outcome more likely. And yet, Pito goes against that for the sake of what Meruem wants and doesn't hesitate to do it for a moment. Kilawa's comparison of her defense of this weak and wounded girl to that of a mother protecting a cub is incredibly apt. Not just because of Pito's animalistic origins, but because of the base foundation for this protection being born of strong love. <laughs> この the dialogue here and the way that Pito articulates and conceptualizes this whole situation is brilliant. As someone completely foreign to these feelings, Pito spells things out in such a literal way. 
This helps make the situation clear for her own benefit, of course, but I also just think that this was her way of describing the internal situation that must have been confusing to her in bare-bones terms. No mentions of love or care, only ones of importance. But we get the message. The idea that she has indirectly grown to care for Komugi's safety still does not compute, so she can only describe it in terms that she understands. But in spite of the description, that care is real for what it means to Meruem. And note the contrast between her and Poof. She must preserve Komugi because if not, the king will cease being who he is. Far from trying to change him into what he should be, Pito loves Meruem for who Meruem is so much that changing him is heart-wrenching to her. And so she is willing to beg, crawl, tear off her own limbs, and submit herself to achieve the one thing that she feels her life has led to. If she can achieve it, Meruem can be fulfilled. If she fails, her life is forfeit, and she is nothing. Above all, at this point, Meruem's mission for her is currently incomplete, and she cannot accept failure. Not just because it would invalidate her existence, but because it would send the one who is important to her into darkness. And so now her purity hinges on the light. However, throughout the conflict, she is constantly looking for a way to kill Gon out of fear that he would eventually go after the king. And through getting to know his personal motives, further rapid evolution and realization occur within her. She has experienced fear for her king's safety, fear for his emotional well-being, and overall now knows the pain of fear of loss in general. And so having suffered this herself, she's able to apply this to Gon's suffering and see that Kite is to Gon what Meruem is to her. She's able to see the beauty and tragedy of connection. And in relating, she's able to deeply, honestly apologize. She knows how much he's hurting, and she can't help but feel sad at the fact that she caused such pain. <laughs> She has to kill Gon in order to protect her king, but that does not make her apology any less sincere. Here there is absolutely none of the playful, cat-like malevolence that she embodied early on. Just raw sorrow that things had to turn out this way. Because now that she understands people, she realizes that there is nothing to be happy or flippant about in this situation. Yet, along with her ability to empathize with others and feel true care, her rapid evolution leads to one more very important change. The nature of her acts of duty. And this is what can lead us along the train of thought that makes her one of the most emotional characters in the story. Before she would offer herself wholly to the king because that was the duty that defined her being. But now, she does the same thing out of a pure care for him. A selflessness born from obligation transforms into a selflessness born from love. To heal Komugi at all cost, despite there not being any benefit to her personally. To keep Gon away from Meruem no matter what. In a period of time where Meruem was so very alone and conflicted, Komugi was undoubtedly his shining light and salvation. But Pito played just as big a factor through seeing him with no misconceptions and saving his soul. To be clear, Pito did extremely bad things, and none of the reasoning behind them that I've explained and none of her later progression makes that okay. But her trajectory is more than enough for me to feel extremely emotionally connected to her as a character, and very sad that she had to meet such a fate after turning such a corner but before being able to use that experience to change her life. For me, the tragedy of Never Pito is not at all based in the fact that she died whilst being so loyal. I think the saddest part about Pito's death is that in this early portion of what could have been a long life, she was never able to live and think about her own well-being, about herself. <laughs> Okay. 
She was fulfilled through Meruem's fulfillment, and his desires were her desires, but when did she ever spare a thought for what she wanted to do in life? Who she wanted to be? Of course, the possibility exists that even after a ton of experience and reflection, she would have hypothetically landed at the same place she had been already. Maybe her purpose for living was for her loved ones. Maybe expressing her care altruistically was the basis of her true identity. And maybe her behavior during the palace invasion was her version of living for herself. It's definitely a distinct possibility that wouldn't feel out of place for Pito's characterization. But what I mean here is that life is a series of detours from which we grow in innumerable ways, and Pito was simply not given the opportunity to learn about herself and find out what she wanted. She only ever knew her duty, and so she could only ever apply her human traits to that duty. She was forced into a role and embraced that role. But after learning that there was more to life, she wasn't able to choose for herself after having grown from these complex situations. Yet, you cannot say that it isn't fitting or poetic writing given that she herself cut short so many similarly unfulfilled lives prior to this. Having grown to understand the weight of death, maybe she'd say that she doesn't really have anything to complain about. Out of the three royal guards, I think Pita was comfortably the one most capable of forging a relatively normal life for herself outside of her duty. I don't know if it would have happened for sure, but I think that we have just enough evidence by the end to show us that it was very possible. It may have taken him being literally spiritually bound to Meruem to understand his true love for Komugi and his true identity, but in the end, Poof was able to comprehend a perspective outside of his own. Yuppie's fight with Knuckle, Shoot, Melioron, and Morel shows us that he was more than capable of forging bonds with others in a way that contradicted his original purpose. And while Pito's empathetic nature functioned almost exclusively for her king, that core of emotional intelligence had the potential to give rise to seeing the perspectives of others as well. And we see the beginnings of that through her very real and genuine apology to Gon for not being able to revive his lost mentor. I think that if things continued to progress, she would have been able to live a very fulfilling life for both herself and those she cared for. But fate was not that kind, and instead, she died, content, but not daring to wish for anything more, before any of these questions could be answered. A gratifying self-sacrifice for an individual happy to have devoted herself to the true wishes of the one she loved. Many thanks for watching.